Greetings fellow humans and welcome to the Renaissance Yorkshireman podcast. Today I'd like to continue with my series about education and specifically today I want to talk about the zone of proximal development and the flow state because these two things are fundamental to understanding what the philosophy of an education system should be and is in some cases around the world. But I would argue that as a general rule, these ideas are not at the heart of education systems as they absolutely should be. In the first instance, what is the flow state? Well, it's a strange state of mind that was first studied and spoken about and written about by a psychologist who I believe was either Russian or Czech with the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he describes being in the flow state thus, being completely involved in an activity for its own sake. The ego falls away, time flies. Every action, movement and thought follows inevitably from the previous one, like playing jazz. Your whole being is involved and you're using your skills to the utmost. I think it's very interesting that he mentions jazz because for jazz musicians, they have skills. They have skills at playing their instrument. There are also boundaries to how they can play and different time frames in how they can play. And some of it is spontaneous. So it's a combination of skill, things that you've done before, but with spontaneity as well. And the flow state, it's one of those states of mind and states of being that we can describe intellectually, but you can only really understand it in an experiential manner. It's, it's an experience that's beyond words. If two Olympians, it doesn't matter what sport, it could be any sport, were to meet, and let's say one's from Russia and one's from China, and they have no way of speaking together, they still understand the flow state in the same experiential manner because it is fundamental to the human experience. It's beyond culture. It knows no racial or gender or sexuality boundaries. It's one of the things that fundamentally makes us human. Author and journalist Stephen Kotler defines flow thus. Technically, flow is defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and perform our best. It's also a strange state of consciousness. In flow, concentration becomes so laser focused that everything else falls away. Action and awareness merge. Our sense of self and our sense of self-consciousness completely disappear. Time dilates, meaning it slows down like the freeze frame of a car crash, or speeds up, and five hours pass by in five minutes. And throughout, all aspects of performance are incredibly heightened, and that includes creative performance. Paul McCartney and John Lennon, and uh, Jagger and Richards, they didn't write their songs in a beta brainwave state, in the normal state of mind that we do for like washing the dishes or tidying the house. They were in the flow state when they were writing their music. For example, Salvador Dali, the artist, when he created his works of art, he was in the flow state. Dorothy Hodgkins did not pioneer protein crystallography in a beta brainwave state. She did it in the flow state. And the flow state will normally be an alpha brainwave state of mind. But under certain circumstances, people may even go into a theta brainwave state. Kendra Cherry, in her article, What is Flow? Understanding the Psychology of Flow, has this to say about how individuals attain the flow state. She says, Flow experiences can occur in different ways for different people. Some might experience flow while engaging in a sport, such as skiing, tennis, soccer, dancing or running. Others might have an experience while engaged in an activity such as 
painting, drawing, or writing. So the flow state is often associated with creative activities. And indeed, I would argue that anyone who engages in creative activities on a regular basis, and what may be creative for one person may not be creative for another. So I use this phrase creative activity in a very broad sense, will have experienced the flow state. And many of us, hopefully most of us, and in post-capitalist societies of the future, it certainly will be most of us, will experience the flow state on a regular basis, on a weekly basis at least, or preferably on a daily basis. So this raises, this raises any number of questions, one of which is how does it feel to experience flow? Now, according to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, there are 10 possible factors that occur during the flow state, although it may not be the case that all 10 occur every time, but at least some of them will always occur, and there may well be some circumstances where all 10 occur. So, number one, clear goals that, while challenging, are still attainable. Two, strong concentration and focused attention. Three, the activity is intrinsically rewarding. And in the next weeks, I'll make a video about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, because intrinsic and extrinsic motivation are fundamentally important for education systems. Four, feeling of serenity, a loss of feeling of self-consciousness. Five, timelessness, feeling so focused on the present that you lose track of time passing. Six, immediate feedback. Seven, knowing the task is doable, the balance between skill level and the challenge presented. Eight, feeling of personal control over the situation and the outcome. Nine, a lack of awareness of physical needs. 10, complete focus on the activity itself. I'd like to just mention a little bit of my experience of the flow state. I've experienced a flow state in a variety of activities, but it took me seven years to write my book there, The Tower of Sustainable Development, a new post-capitalist paradigm. When I was writing it, for much of the time I was in the flow state, I found that when I was writing, I would do blocks of normally between about 30 minutes and about 50 minutes. So usually 40, 45 minutes or so. And I would start writing and I would get completely immersed in the writing and time would pass. And at a certain point, there would be a change in my brainwave state, not entirely dissimilar to the change in consciousness that occurs when you're waking up, you're asleep, and then you're awake. And they're two quite distinctly different states of consciousness. So in my own case, I would get to a point and I would suddenly feel really tired and I would look around and I would be aware of my room. And often I would suddenly need the toilet now, this hadn't occurred to me while I was doing the writing, or I might suddenly feel extremely hungry. So this idea that your, your, your body and your mind are in a distinctly different state is absolutely true in my experience. And I'm sure that most of the people watching this will have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. Why is this important to education? Well, quite simply, if you have an education system that is not aiming to inculcate the flow state for its students on a daily basis, then you have an education system which is fundamentally flawed. And here's where I'd like to talk about the zone of proximal development. In my view, the zone of proximal development is fundamentally related to the flow state. And it's also related to what journalist and author Daniel Coyle calls deep practice. And he talks about this in his book, The Talent Code. I'm not going to investigate the talent code today, but I will make a future video about it because I think it's very important. 
The person who came up with this phrase, the zone of proximal development, was a Russian psychologist called Lev Vygotsky. And he describes the zone of proximal development thus. It is the difference between the actual development level as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development as determined through problem solving under adult guidance or in collaboration with more capable peers. So let's imagine a situation which arises in schools on a regular basis. Let's imagine we have a student, 12 years old, a girl, she's doing a maths problem. And the maths problem has many parts. Let's say there are 12 marks, so there are at least four different parts of this problem. And perhaps by herself, she can get all of the first part and half of the second part. So she's maybe scoring five or six out of 12 so far by herself. But with adult guidance, so the teacher comes and helps her, or one of her peers who is better at maths comes and helps her. And this peer or the teacher might start to ask her questions like, have you thought about trying X? Or they might say, look what you've done in this first part of the question, why don't you try applying that in the second part of the second question? And they might try little prompts like this, and then she'll start thinking, and suddenly she'll start applying different things, which she wouldn't have by herself, but because she's getting prompting, either from the teacher or her peer, she can then make further progress, and this is the zone of proximal development. She stepped out of what she knows by herself. She's got a little bit of help, and sometimes it might be a lot of help, but she can now make more progress because she's made the maximum progress by herself, and now she can only make more progress with help. And I would argue that this zone of proximal development is fundamentally related to the flow state, and indeed, I think that the zone of proximal development is one of the ways to facilitate the flow state in the classroom. The final point I'd like to make about the flow state and the zone of proximal development is twofold. One, it's extremely practical. This is what should be happening in a classroom on a daily basis. And it can be facilitated by competent teachers who have the right situation set up by their education system, and it can be done on a daily basis. But secondly, it's got to be a fundamental driving force of the philosophy of education, because if we're not aiming to facilitate the zone of proximal development and the flow state on a daily basis for our students, then what's the point in sending them to school and what's the point in being a teacher? You might as well bang your head against the wall or become a, or, or bin your job and become a taxi driver or a window cleaner. Now, no disrespect to taxi drivers and window cleaners because we need taxi drivers and we need window cleaners. But for teachers, so many of them are in this frustrating position where they want to facilitate the flow state for their students. Now, they might not word it like that, but that's really what they mean. But they can't do it because the classes are too big, because they're having to do too much admin work. All sorts of reasons exist why it doesn't happen. But I would argue that any education system that is not set up to do this on a daily basis is fundamentally flawed and it should be binned. And we have to have this at the heart of education in all our post-capitalist systems of the future. Thank you for giving me your time today. Peace.